Wednesday. And we're going to start out with uh, Trevor Cutta and take it away. Thank you. This, uh, um, the title of this is Decentralizing the Liberal Conception of Money. And I will hopefully that will be a little bit clearer by the end of this. It presents a relatively small part of a very large intellectual project. What I'm trying to do is create a new paradigm, popular word, for understanding the economy. The ultimate goal is to integrate economic activity into a realistic understanding of human nature and society. In other words, what I want to do is present a genuine homo economicus. This is a person homo who strives for virtue and transcendental excellence while being susceptible to sin. A person who lives in communities and societies in which there is both harmony and discord. To place this person in the economy as it really is, to make him or her economicus, I have first to clear up some intellectual rubble to discredit several collections of pervasive misunderstandings about economic matters. The confusions about the nature of money, which is my topic today, are both prominent and typical. I should start by framing this a little more, which is to say that critics of modernity generally hate money, some of them, often driving, drawing on the ideas articulated by the young Marx, describe the modern reliance on money as something like substance abuse. Money is a drug which leads to personal and social alienation. It dissolves traditions, it debases the notion of value, and reduces everything noble to an arbitrary number. If you add some more dogmatic economic Marxists and their fellow travelers, they say that money is a crucial weapon in modern class warfare, which of course they identify as one of the central themes or the central theme of modern society. There's another more positive view. Enthusiasts for money, and especially for the modern economy, see money as both good and crucial. It is good because it objectively measures the values of whatever needs to be valued objectively, or possibly it subjectively measures the value of whatever needs to be value measured um, subjectively, but with nice numbers. And it is crucial because it stores those numerical values and moves them smoothly and neatly over time and space. They're even what you might call money groupies, people who postulate a sort of monetary physics in which impersonal market forces expressed in monetary terms not only set monetary values, but actually make all important economic choices untouched, as it were, by human rationality. These two groups of thinkers are violently opposed to each other in many ways. However, they agree that money is at the center of the modern economy, and that it plays a significant role in shaping the broader society and culture. I'm here to tell you that that's wrong. In the economy, the money of everyday earning and spending is nothing worse or better than useful. In the society and culture, this money is almost nothing. <coughs> It is neither sinister nor solid, neither especially alienating or anything like an objective quantitative standard of value. It basically is what Heidegger says that technology is not, that is, it is a neutral tool. This monetary claim is dull. It is ambitiously dull, I like to think. <laughs> However, it is subject to a serious qualification. What I am calling money is neutral, but there are other things which are not neutral that go by the same name. In philosophical terms, the word money is used equivocally. That is, it refers to several conceptual distinct, conceptually distinct things. The distinctions are genuine, but they are often easy to miss, since a particular piece of money, a $10 bill or $1,000 in the bank, can easily move from one of my categories of money to another. I identify three of these categories. The kind I'm talking about today for almost the entire presentation is a numerical token of something in the economy. So I call it imaginatively token money. At the end of this paper, I will briefly mention the two other categories, treasure money and symbol money. They are both more exciting and more culturally significant than token money, so I try not to fall asleep before I get to them. What is token money? It is a token in the great exchange. And what is the great exchange? That is the key to my whole analysis of the economy. This great exchange describes what economic activity actually is at the deepest anthropological or ontological level. This is the basic economic exchange, and it goes like this. 
In one direction, there are people who offer their labor as a gift to humanize the world. In the other direction, there is the humanized world which gives its gifts to people. These gifts, these fruits of human labor, are consumption goods and services. Now, there's a lot to be said about this great exchange of labor and consumption. I might want to start with a defense of my use of the broad and vague word of gifts to the world and from the world to describe the flow of labor and consumption, instead of what economists usually talk about, which would be transactions and contracts. My topic today, money, is related to that disputable, disputed description, but it is much narrower. Now, what does money do? In a way, the role is obvious. Money exchange, money and monetary exchanges, paying wages or prices, mirror or mediate the great exchange. Money is used to pay the wages of labor, and it pays the prices of consumption goods and services. But why? Why do people create and use this intermediary token? Why can they not simply consume and labor without paying or being paid? And also, what does it do? What effect? What does the use of money actually do to the human world relationship that makes up the economy and to the whole society and culture in which the economy is always embedded? These, there are three monetary observations that will help answer the question. The first, is that the great exchange does not require money. Indeed, the modern economies made very limited use of token money before the industrial age. Even today, most of the labor performed at home remains money free. Neither parents nor children put a monetary price on the food and cuddles that they share or give away. The second observation is that there is something unnatural, something artificial and arbitrary about money. This comes way back to Aristotle, who pointed out that money creates a commensurability which the things that money pays for do not naturally have. We cannot provide numbers that meaningfully express, say, an hour of threshing labor, talking pre-industrial, in terms of an hour spent feeding a baby or writing software, to move it up to date. Such cross-category comparisons, when they produce ratios, prices, or numbers, but this time threshing is worth so much many minutes of nursing or so many lines of software. These numbers are nothing more than disrespectful fictions, disrespectful because, well, because people aren't numerical. You can't count human categories. The final observation is that money is amazingly useful. This malleable fiction allows each person's wages to be converted into many different baskets of consumption goods and services, clothes, lipstick, chairs, whatever, houses, transport, and allows the price of each good and service to be converted back into a tiny part of the wages of numerous widely dispersed laborers, everyone at the lipstick factory, the clothes factory, the transport system. It would take me a long time to describe all the wonderful, helpful things that money facilitates. But that long analysis leads to a simple conclusion. The more complex the economy, that is, the more specialized the laborers, the more intricate the chains of production, the more useful money will be in the great exchange for that economy, of that economy. So guided by these three observations, that money is optional, that it's unnatural, and that it's amazingly useful, I can answer the why question. Why do we use money? We use it because it helps organize labor and consumption. And we use it when a numerical placeholder, however artificial, can usefully help in arranging the inherently non-numerical part of this, if the human condition, this non, inherently non-numerical part. So that also gives us a hint about the answer to the what question. What does money do? Token money, here's the dull part, does not do much either to the economy or to society. There's nothing omnipotent about it, nothing ineluctable about its logic. It's human decisions that control the total amount of money in circulation. It's human decisions that set all individual prices and wages. There is nothing deeply meaningful about those prices and wages. Those money numbers have relations to objective, <coughs> objective factors, labor power, and so forth, scarcity. But those connections are all muddled and indirect. Money has no moral qualities. It's not good or bad, token money. 
nor is this token money in any way wise. The money groupies are all wrong. Wages and prices don't make judgments about factories or workers or pollution levels. People make those decisions. They may make use of monetary information, but they cannot, cannot delegate their economic responsibility to some impersonal and largely fictional world of wages and prices. So the critics of money have the wrong target. Token money is not responsible for any of the woes of modern society. Money is not at the center of capitalism. It does not clearly pollute human relations. Indeed, money, which has replaced other forms of human relations in the economy, its money is not obviously more alienating than, say, feudal obligations or slavery. Money does not need to be used when, it's not judged, when it is judged to be inappropriate. And we do judge it to be inappropriate. In developed economies, many important types of consumption have been removed from the monetary economy. People receive without paying for emergency services, police, fire, for primary and secondary education, and in civilized countries for tertiary education and for most of their health care. Uh, so we don't need to use money, and we don't want to. We can work without it in the economy. So such examples cast really severe doubt on the deep criticisms of money. They also embarrass the enthusiasts who think money is always desirable and helpful scale of value. In reality, people do not, often do not want their labor and consumption to be measured on a monetary scale. In reality, wages and prices are influenced by too many shifting forces to be precise indicators of anything non-monetary. A euro is worth a euro, but that's about as far as it goes. I can understand, though, why money is often treated as a sort of sacrament or an anti-sacrament of the secular age. Money has these odd characteristics. It's insubstantial, it's malleable, it has a concentrated power because it buys so many things. It has an apparent potential infinity because you can always have more of it. It gives it a kind of air of transcendence in our non-transcendental age. And its numerical nature, for those who don't like this age, seems to express something about the modern desire to look at each human and natural thing as something that essentially can be counted and precisely compared. But these appearances are deceptive. Token money is almost unbearably mundane. There is nothing sinister or wonderful in its spread. It's just worse. Now, briefly, I mentioned, mentioned treasure money. It is quite different from token money. As the name implies, this type of money is something of value which is treasured, stored up, not circulated, not used for paying wages or prices. Traditionally, treasure money was held in treasuries, which held gold and jewels and shiny wonders. But we live in a mundane age. Today's treasure money is mostly intangible. Balances in bank accounts and financial assets, or tangible but very unglamorous land. Now this treasure money really does deserve critical, serious, critical study. While token money is no more contrary to God than anything else in the created world, treasure money really does easily end up working for the unjust kingdom of mammon. For example, high land prices reinforce economic social inequality in both neighborhoods and countries. And there's more to be said, much more about that. But I just want to close with the final type of money, symbol money. And it is by far the most interesting, that's why I saved it for last, because money has such a, what Charles Taylor calls a rich imaginary. It's symbolic event, vocabulary, I have 21 examples in the book I'm writing, but I'll give you just a few. It includes greed, you can think of Midas, generosity, think of Aristotle's virtue of magnanimity, the power, Marx, when I mentioned, liberation, think neoliberal politics, you think money is liberating, community, think of the political unity of the Europe, expressed in the monetary euro. And all this symbolism is truly fascinating. But what I want to say today is that it's basically irrelevant to the great exchange. It may influence our thoughts, but it's not really relevant to the reality of what we're doing in the economy. In today's economy, most money is token money. It's mundane and does, does not deserve any metaphysical law. Send it to the engineers. Now, I can't quite explain why so many observers of monetarity are fixated on money. I gave you some hints. But it's bad because they often ignore features which are much more significant to the modern economic experience. For example, the new idea of employment relations, relationships, bureaucratic structures, regulatory arrangements. 
tend for the technological developments and choices. But I'll continue to ponder the monetary obsession. As I mentioned, I'm writing a book on it. But what I can say for certainty now is that money receives much more economic attention than it deserves, much more sociological attention than it deserves, as utopian money does. To understand the economy, the great exchange, and to make it a better servant of the common good, money should be kept in its appropriate, modest place. Thank you. Uh, next, we have uh, Martin Mulvaney. abstract of this paper at the end of September 2018, Hungary was already in a bad situation, but not as bad as now, when I'm laboring this talk. <laughs> in the time since September 2018, then, in the, in the past four and a half months, the Hungarian legislation forced our only university with real international success, the Central European University, to move. In addition, a part of the judicial powers was subordinated to the legislative powers. The tendentious concentration of power in the media has increased realistically and symbolically, and finally, the Hungarian government has started to liquidate the whole network of research institutions of the Hungarian Academy of Sciences, founded in the 19th century as the intellectual pioneer of Hungarian national sovereignty, but having the same method, method it had once successfully employed in the case of the Central European University. What common factor? in these four changes do I consider to be the most important ones. All four serve to mute critical utterances. The question arises, why do we not hear a prophetic critical voice from Christian denominations, or rather from Christian theology? The organized silence of Christianity in Hungary is a symbiosis in the system. As a Catholic theologian from Hungary, I seek to understand the six symbiosis within the system in the first part of my talk, in order to put the following questions in the second part, moving away from the specific example of Hungary. In the place of theoretical theology, can we establish such, such an authentic theology that can function as, as, an, as, in, as a contemporary biblical theory? Thus, the first question is, what is happening in Central Eastern Europe at present, especially in Hungary? In order to understand the almost unhindered advancement of populism, we have to take into account at least three historical precedents. The Reformation, the European Enlightenment, and the unprocessed traumas caused by the 20th uh, century right and left-wing dictatorships. We should discuss these topics in their own complexity individually in the case of each country, but for our purpose it might be enough to focus on the fact that the Eastern European reception of all three historical changes or the lack of it, is related to the nature of Christian theological practice and the relationship of Christian denominations to the state. In short, to the duality of authority and freedom. Poland, for instance, could fight for its own autonomy against Soviet communism with a more preserving social collaboration than Hungary, the people which was the solidarity movement. In turn, Poland, according to Hanskin, could not reap the fruits of the Reformation or the European Enlightenment. Hungary was more successful primarily in the reception of the 16th century Reformation. In addition, through a narrower intellectual circle, Hungarian versions of the Enlightenment could also take root. The outstanding, and at the same time, in many respects, unfortunately, singular intention of resistance of the, 15, uh, of the 1956 revolution proved to be, through the eyes of the present, understandably not enough compared to the 40-year-long communist dictatorship. Hungarian society, like many other societies belonging to the post-Soviet bloc, began rebuilding a modern democracy at the end of the 20th century in an enervated way. 
As far as I am concerned, out of many circumstances, the most important psychological deficit was caused by the fact that we had not faced the past at the expense of our democratic aspirations, which started 30 years ago. We are still not aware who the collaborators were from the Hungarian political life, or to what extent that they, uh, they collaborated during the years of the communist dictatorship. The secret list of agents may make research work impossible for our historians. Thus, disclosure is not available as, is not available for us, which would make us face the past, and through the crisis could lead us to catharsis. The little and fragmented data that still is available for us reflects a very grave picture. There is hardly any family and hardly any small religious community that could stay free from the system of spies. It may not be necessary to elaborate how much this ruined the level of trust in the society. The authenticity of churches and their relations to politics are especially sensitive areas in this question, since the church is functioning for a long time as a last resort of opposition, has been corrupted throughout the decades by gradual and strong recruitment work. It is important to note at this point, without blaming anyone personally, that one-third of the active members of the Hungarian Catholic Bishops' Conference were born in 1950 or earlier, that is, at the dawn of the communist dictatorship. They had socialized when they studied theology as seminarians in an environment and historical situation that was characterized by the lack of trust, spying, and the terror of punishing orders. Since after the transition, even the Hungarian Catholic Church has not faced the problems, possibilities of renewal are also limited. Stories of unrevealed collaborations and incurable wounds of trust implicitly organize the presentation of the Church. It is fundamentally important to realize all this if, if we intend to understand why, for example, the practice of Catholic theology, which can possibly take place in Hungary at universities, exclusively affiliated to the Church, is blind in its training curriculums to the 20th century and contemporary critical theories, especially if they are left-wing and have political consequences. The blind spot of theological courses, together with the traumatized, traumatized loss of uh, trust in an institutional level, is responsible for the fact that there is hardly any theological research in Hungary. Moreover, only a weak selection of international research results reaches Christian intellectuals through translations. The same phenomenon is also behind the fact that the presenting governing party has been firmly rejected by the leaders and members of the Hungarian Catholic Church due to, uh, to its liberal attitude 30 years ago, and that they warmly welcomed later the same party as conservatives. And since 2014, so-called illiberal turn of the party taken place since that time. This ominous I mean, illiberal turn was announced by Viktor Orban um, on the uh, 25th of July uh, in 2014 in his famous Transylvanian speech. <coughs> Freddy Zakaria, who was the first to discuss the notion of illiberal democracy in 1997 on the pages of Foreign Affairs, reacted to the speech on the columns of Washington Post in the following. I never, imagine, I, quote, I never imagined that a national leader from Europe, no less, would use the term as a badge of honor, end quote. <laughs> In the following part of the reaction, faithfully to its uh, title, The Rise of Putinism, Farid compares the conceptions of the Hungarian leader to Vladimir Putin's Russian go uh, go governing tactics. In light of the above, there is no need to elaborate how easy it is to find points of connection between uh, between the present Russian government and the Hungarian conception of government stuck in the trauma of the Iron Curtain. In Russia, the relationship between the Orthodox Church and the state is still characterized by a few significant features of Caesar that is, being familiar with the Hungarian ambitions of foreign policy and external economy, at this point we have reached today's, uh, we have reached today's conception of populist structures of loyal and subordinated to the churches. We also saw examples for open uh, agitations in the church after our liturgy um, in Hungary. The strong relationship between the political elite also naming themselves as conservative with leaders of the church features another recurring motif from a theological point of view not mentioned before, the popularity of mariological questions. This is 
in connection with the fact that these national churches, with their zealous cult of Mary and the frequent practice of prayer liturgy, are significantly different from the order of service in other countries. It would be worthwhile to examine once through the statistics of uh, publications that in countries of either South America or Europe or other continents, where the political system is a hybrid democratic or totalitarian dictatorship, how much more often theologians have written about St. Mary or angelology, for example. I cannot prove it yet, but according to my hypothesis, the more centralized a political culture is and the more loyal uh, the local Catholic Church is to the governing system, the more particular the examined the theological topics are. In any case, examples for the interrelation between the cult of Mary and conservatism <coughs> are the files of the Second Vatican Council, which proves that among the debating bishops, members of the conservative wing were dedicated to supporting the Church to name the Holy Virgin as co-savior in the level of the Mass. Since the present government offers great material support for the voting base of the Church, it can count on the support of the Churches. This support increases at the time of elections. Between the elections, leaders of the church advocate measures compatible with the moral teachings of the church with open communication, and problematic, uh, and problematic measures, for example, the question of migration or, or the uh, corruption, with sheer silence. My answer to the question put at the beginning of my talk is this. Why is the church silent when it should let its prophetic voice be heard, seeing the measures of the government? This phenomenon is symbolically sealed by the name Christian Democratic Party, a member of the party alliance forming the government in Hungary. This party is a political force that cannot be measured on its own. The larger governing party, named Fidesz, has hired them in order that either, either define with their name and values. They could hold them up as an ideological shield. It may be clear from all this why the relationship between the secular state and the church in Hungary could be described by the attributive phrase political Christianity appearing in the title of my paper. From the historical concentration of the state and church, this contemporary political Christianity in Hungary is the spiritual heir of the activity of Theodosius the Great, Justinian the Great, and John Calvin. Now, uh, I have to Calvin. Calvin as a lawyer reorganized the public uh, administration, education, and most of all the religious life of Genoa, and arranged the political and religious life of the reformed city state already according to the norms of the European modern era. The Prime Minister of Hungary is a member of the denomination founded by Calvin, who had strict morals and outstanding educations. Uh, to Calvin. Between uh, uh, 2012 and 2018, Victor Orban appointed Zoltan Bolo as the head of the super minister responsible for the public education, culture, and healthcare, who is not only a Calvinist clergyman, but has also been the personal spiritual leader of Victor Orban for long years. To balance the Calvinist denomination, the prime minister ensured a deputy prime minister position responsible for national policy for the leader of the Christian Democratic Party, who happens to be a Catholic theologian. Therefore, Hungary is in a special, but unfortunately not in a unique situation. According to the theological adequate definition of Christianity, primarily Christ should be followed. This supposes the disciple, servant role of Christians in the case of everyone, including the leaders, which undertakes to follow the obedient example of Christ. When in political Christianity, leaders keep theology and the church in a position subordinated to their own ambitions for power, they avoid the path of obedience, in fact. In the second part of the paper, following the identification of the problem, we should first and foremost face it, or in the religious sense, confess it. So this, from the 20th century theological models, car runners' theory of structural sin seems the most appropriate. When the reality of political Christianity develops in Hungary or in other countries in different varieties, it is necessarily in a state which indicates not an individual, but a, system, a systemic sin. Populist leadership could not exist had it not been elected in a democratic or at least semi-democratic way. A considerable part of Hungarian voters have elected the formation of political Christianity for the third time. This becomes a structural sin since criticism formulated in the name of Christianity, however authentic, is undermined from the beginning by the fact that the whole political system declares to act with reference to Christianity. 
the church that had once already legitimized political Christianity by its support or silence has itself become part of the system. In the meantime, criticism of Christianity coming from outside can never be authentic enough compared to the critical voice coming from within. If the Hungarians watch the recording of this talk, a significant part of the society will attack me as traitor or an anti-Christian theologian. I am convinced that when I apologize to you and before you for the sinful identifications covering up or acts in the Catholic Church, I am in fact practicing my profession or my vocation. After getting familiar with the facts according to our power, there is no other way to follow Christ but to apologize. Now I do apologize in the first place to you, and later more Christian people will apologize to everyone for the corruption, the corruption of political Christianity, or for example, the sexual abuses destroying the American Catholic Church, and unfortunately, we could continue this list. The characteristic of nature of structural sin is that as a member of the given social order, we cannot speak of individual innocence. The line of individual uh, conversions is necessary for a, for a converted church to fulfill its prophetic vocation again. This prophetic role, died for sin and resurrected for life, is something that theologians should make sure today to be a critical theory. This new initiation rite must be the living of our baptism, which brings a deeper commitment to Christian obedience. I use the symbol of baptism on the cross. <coughs> According to my hypothesis, every Christian denomination, including the Catholic Church in the first place, needs the reinterpretation of the Augustinian notion of original sin. It is a dogmatic necessity that at the transmission of the origin of sin, the medium should not be so called competence because it would have unforeseeably grave consequences to our anthropology and moral theology. Instead of this, the theological task is all the more to describe the reality of the origin of sin with the relationships in the center, similar to the command of love centering around uh, relationships. This is why, specifically, the conception of runner thinking in terms of the structural sense uh, of social relationships is a suitable starting point. If the original sin can indeed be redefined like this, the mechanism of salvation and grace can also become based on relationships. This is also more appropriate even to trinitologically and anthropologically, since it makes it possible to interpret salvation history as interactions between persons. The reception of grace can take place through an institutional and social cleansing created for the model of personal conversion and baptism. Three theological starting points should be provided by the renewed theology built on the basis described above. The new methodological character, the eschatological approach to history, and the theoretical elaboration of the eschaticism of spiritual age of majority. Firstly, the reason why it is necessary to carry out systematic research on the nature of the Holy Spirit, its presence in the world and its church leading activity, because only it can bring renewal and provide an appropriate understanding of our, ourselves even today. If we examine the date of pneumatological debates, it turns out that it always lifted the eras of great, of great theological ignorance following the critical periods of church history. Secondly, history and the actual political system in it should again be, uh, be observed in the light of eschatology. Referring to Martin Heidegger, forerunning to our own death is something that can give a proper place to the value even the activity of the day. I agree with Ratzinger, who warned us not to put every hope of ours into a specific political structure. And lastly, Last, it is necessary for more theology to elaborate such principles that do not force the believers to take up the role of the children, but that help them to make decisions as adults with a major conscience in every respect. The political aspect of such a renewing theology that is based on relationships is only competent to become the critical theory of tomorrow. Thank you. Okay, now Austin Kopat. Good morning. I'm here primarily as a theologian and practicing uh, in church.
church context. So for me, this came out of very practical concerns of ministry. Uh, in his recent Cultural Liturgies trilogy, philosopher James K. Smith develops a pedagogy of desire in which he challenges intellectualist priorities in Christian education by arguing that it is not our thinking or feeling that is most basic for our human existence, but our habits. It is these which cultivate our loves and ultimately determine and explain our behaviors. Smith's notion of a Christian habitus and his Augustinian anthropology may be considered a theological complement to the philosophy of Ludwig Wittgenstein. The social account of language proposed in the later Wittgenstein suggests that the meanings of concepts arise amongst pre-linguistic communal practices. If this is the case, then theological language cannot be abstracted from its concrete expressions of the world because its meaning is dependent upon a historically Christian form of life. As Wittgenstein puts it, the end is not certain propositions striking us immediately as true. That is, it's not a kind of seeing on our part. It is our acting, which lies at the bottom of the language game. Only as a Christian community engages in cruciform practices does Christian theology acquire its distinctive sense. Wittgenstein asks, how do I know that two people mean the same thing when each says he believes in God? Practice gives their words their sense. So in conjunction, Smith's Augustine anthropology raises the stakes by characterizing all human practices, religious or otherwise, as teleological structures for desire formation. This paper explores his contribution of Wittgenstein to theology through Smith's liturgical project in order to address a prevalent disconnect between theology and practice in contemporary Western Christianity. I'll briefly examine some syncretistic tendencies that arise from competing forms of life in a pluralistic society, some important epistemic and anthropological shifts that are necessary, and the implica implications of these shifts for Christian pedagogy. Uh, so some competing forms of life, uh, the problem. If it is actually uh, our habits which precede our beliefs as foundational for who we are as humans, as Wittgenstein suggests, then we should not expect sound teaching alone to produce distinctive Christian people because we are constantly being subliminally socialized into an amalgam of uh, alternative and competing forms of life. Consequently, there are U.S. Christians who sincerely espouse biblical doctrines, whilst it's simultaneously embodying practices of modern democratic liberalism that may be antithetical to those same beliefs. American sociologist Christian Smith argues that the contemporary plurality of practices and values in a modern liberal society results in competing and blended moral orders, such as a biblical tradition, a republican tradition, utilitarian individualism, and expressive individualism, which bleed together into a Christian, capitalist, democratic, romanticist, libertarian, secular thing. He goes on to say that most, religious, or most people live their lives negotiating the demands of multiple religious and non-religious moral orders, compromising here, <coughs> synthesizing there, compartmentalizing elsewhere. Hence, modern life looks more like a shifting kaleidoscope of these habituated loves than a chessboard of intellectual world beliefs or worldviews. And the secular and sacred intertwine as all these practices cultivate ultimate allegiances. So there's no neutrality or distinctive private public spheres. Contrary to claims of secular neutrality, all of our, quote, social institutions are always morally animated enterprises. Uh, so that every embodied practice in which we engage is actually an enculturation that forms us towards some telos. Um, and we can look at all sorts of cases here uh, in America with religious right and rising nationalism. And uh, I would argue you can see this kind of syncretistic tendency in two areas of, of behavior of American Christians. Uh, first. Uh, being money. So according to nonprofit source, despite New Testament admonitions uh, against accumulating wealth and a lot of emphasis on radical generosity, we see in America that only 5% of Christians actually tithe, and of those, 80% only give 2% of their income, which as you'll know is not a tithe at all. Uh, this is down from 3.3% during the Great Depression. Now, Perhaps the radical American, uh, rad perhaps the discipleship of American Christians is not out competing the formational <laughs> practices of consumerism in a market driven society. Even if it's preached well, the theology of grace embodied weekly in an act of tithing might quickly be drowned out on Monday morning as parishioners re enter the alleged public sphere with its competing web of value laden practices. Whether it be a physical mall with its sensory enticements or the potentially more self-indulgent online marketplace with carefully tailored advertisements, all of our economic practices cultivate in us the commodification of our lives through a liturgy of consumption. Uh, and this is quoting James Smith here. He says, modern liberal democratic capitalism and the cultural ontology that floats it is now through the process of globalization and marketing, colonizing most regions of the world and most aspects of our lives. 
end quote. These consumer exchanges then reinforced in us a disposition that our resources are private goods <coughs> existing for our personal fulfillment. Human flourishing itself then becomes defined in terms of material abundance and financial self-sufficiency. Last reading, this is just an issue of private holiness or something like that. A uh, New Testament scholar, N.T. Wright, he draws out some of the social implications of these allegiances. So he says, when human beings give their heartfelt allegiance to and worship that which is not God, they progressively cease to reflect the image of God. And he says, those who worship money increasingly define themselves in terms of it and increasingly treat other people as creditors, debtors, partners, or customers rather than as human beings. So these uh, economic practices begin to affect all of the social relationships. Uh, another area in which we see this is in regards to marital practices. So the Barnett Group found that not only are divorce rates highest in the Bible Belt, conservative Protestant Christians on average have the highest divorce rates in the United States. Now there, there are some important confounding variables here. There's lower income in these parts of the country for college graduates. Uh, people get married younger and more people are getting married in general. So of course you're going to have more divorces. But at the same time, George Barnett cautions too much skepticism here because he says that of more than 70 other moral behaviors they study, when they compare Christians and non-Christians, they rarely find substantial differences. So whether we attribute this inconsistency to a failure of Christian education to produce a distinctive Christian way of life, or simply a false positive response bias for Christian self-identity, the perpetuation of Christianity as primarily a catalog of propositional beliefs or emotional experiences might contribute to the dis this discontinuity. Similar to the act of tithing, contemporary American <coughs> teaching on biblical marriage fails to compete with and may even reinforce cultural perceptions of marriage as primarily a romantic source of individual happiness. Rather than being an arena for sanctification and spiritual maturity, marriage becomes one more consumer product promising self-fulfillment. And didactic teaching alone is inadequate to counter the powerful lure of eroticism for people little practiced in the disciplines of self-denial. In contrast, Wittgenstein's philosophy suggests that what it means to be religious is not simply to have a particular set of beliefs, a worldview, but to live within an integrated religious form of life held together by a whole web of communal practices. This does not degrade the more reflective and contemplative capacities of the human intellect, but it situates these capacities within a larger network of cultural traditions. This dependence of doctrinal beliefs upon daily behavior has often been overlooked in uh, Western Christian education because the self-determining individual of the Enlightenment has, continu has continued on in the Western Christian ethos, providing us the illusion of a disintegrated autonomy in which people are primarily thinkers who choose their beliefs and actions through some rational or intuitive process of internal deliberation. James K. Smith concludes that any philosophical anthropology that fails to appreciate we are liturgical animals and thus fails to appreciate the central role of practices in formation will tend to either reduce Christianity to a belief system or an emotivist experience. A Christian education focused on simply teaching theological truths may succeed in cultivating Christian minds, yet fail to shape the deeper narratives, the, the social imaginaries, bound up in the rest of life, stopping short of actually transforming the whole person by reshaping the object of their loves and reorienting the telos of their habits towards a Christian vision of the common good. Uh, so the social embodiment of knowledge. So in contrast to such a reductive anthropology, Wittgenstein offers a picture of human knowledge and belief that is not grounded uh, in other ideas or beliefs, but arises amidst the most basic pre-linguistic interactions. He says, language, I want to say, is a refinement. Quoting Faust, he says, in the beginning was the deed. So drawing upon language acquisition, he says, the child, I should like, like to say, learns to react in such and such a way, and in reacting doesn't so far know anything. Knowing only begins at a later level. So before learning abstract concepts, we must begin with shared recognizable patterns of behavior that convey basic judgments about the world, judgments which form our grammar. Wittgenstein invites us to imagine, what would it be like if human beings showed no outward signs of pain, didn't groan, grimace, etc.? Then it'd be impossible to teach a child the use of the word toothache. When one says, well, he gave a name to his sensation, one forgets that a great deal of stage setting in the language is presupposed if the mere act of naming is to make sense. So just something as simple as ostension requires socialized uh, behavior. This is to say that everything we do inside our heads is already dependent on our inclusion in a historical community. A uh, Dominican priest, Fergus Kerr, summarizes, one is unable to get hold of, a hold of something independent of one's being initiated into certain common practices. The only a priori is Lebensform. 
applying this to theology, he says that we do not know what doctrine means unless we can see how it is in flesh in human life. Similarly, Anthony Thistleton explains, concepts like being redeemed or being spoken to by God and so on are made intelligible and teachable, not on the basis of private existential experience, but on the basis of a public tradition of certain patterns of behavior. This social particularity and historical situatedness required for our conceptual acquisition, and thus any doctrinal transmission, pushes back on appeals to universal reason and natural <laughs> theology. Hence, pragmatist conclusion that we as humans are contingent creatures. As Alistair McIntyre argues in his book, Dependent Rational Animals, our materiality is something we share with intelligent, pre-linguistic social animals. Human identity, he says, is primarily, even if not only, bodily, and therefore animal identity. And it is by reference to that identity that the continuities of our relationship to others are partly defined. He says that adult human activity and belief are best understood as developing out of, and as still in part dependent upon, modes of belief and activity that we share with some other species of intelligent animal. So that our whole initial bodily comportment towards the world is originally an animal comportment. This has been recently corroborated by research in cognitive science, where the emerging movement of embodied cognition argues that cognition depends upon the kinds of experience that comes from having a body with various sensory motor capacities. And second, these, sens these individual sensory motor capacities are themselves embedded in a more encompassing biological, psychological, and cultural context. The contingency of this anthropology does justice to our human finitude and cleans up some of the confusion around the nature of religious belief by calling into question the entire notion of a private individual. As McIntyre concludes, the vocabulary in which I make intelligible and justify, or fail to justify, my actions and beliefs within a network of relationships of giving and receiving is never merely mine. It is ours, always ours. A set of shared expressions put to shared uses. Uses embedded in a wide range of common practices of receiving and giving in a common form of life. Further pushing back on intellectualist approaches to religion, Wittgenstein claims that faith is simply a thing we do. Only in the myth of a mental process does the believer doubt whether or not he has it. So believing in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, for example, is not a private experience, but an oriented culture Christians come to adopt through the recognizable patterns of faith in the lives of the faithful. This is evident, I think, in the challenge of the Apostle James. Show me your faith apart from your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. It's not a juxtaposition of two equally viable options, but a rejection of unobservable faith that's not only impossible, but simply absurd. Wittgenstein captures this understanding of faith when he says that believing is a kind of disposition of the believing person. This is shown to me in the case of someone else by his behavior. It is in the routines of generous giving, for example, that the grammar of God as creator and sustainer begins to make sense. It is at, only as we forgive those uh, who sin against us that we can actually begin to understand what it means to be forgiven, and only then can we be said to have understood. Uh, the post-liberal ethicist Stanley Hauerwas says it this way, he says, the signs of authenticity of anyone's faith lie in their manner of living it out. Uh, this is not in some internal conviction that accompanies their confession. So we looked at in this pluralist modernity, with all these competing, uh, it's more than just competing worldviews. We have competing forms of life, which are teleological in nature, and we have a social embodied anthropology that is necessary to make sense of those forms of life. Uh, so what are, I think, first notice that some of these, in some ways, is nothing new. Uh, when we look at pedagogies present in the early Christian church, we actually see a similarly holistic pedagogy that takes into account this social embodiment. In his book on the ancient Christian manual known as the Didache, Thomas O'Loughlin describes the catechumens that one had to learn how to live this new lifestyle, one had to be shaped and formed, one had to be gradually initiated into its values and activities, as well as its beliefs. So first, new adher adherents were socialized into a set of rituals and then educated in the systems of belief which find their sense within those practices. And he describes rituals as human signals that operate within societies at so basic a level of interpersonal communication, we are unconscious of them and even that such signals are to a large extent beyond our rational control. The suggestion that is fixed, a fixed part of a formal ritual may equally be a basic gesture that only takes on its formal aspect when used within that specific ritual. So a nod to a passing acquaintance on the street is a ritual action, yet the same notion, uh, notion of acknowledgement can take on a formal ritual form in a salute. Rituals are everywhere in life, not just in musty ceremonies frequented by those who like that sort of thing because they show us and those around us who we are and what are our most pressing concerns. Our rituals create the world we inhabit and call our culture, 
So any grouped good done. Tools. Okay. The adopted way of life will develop whether it's set out to or not, a set of rituals to give shape to that lifestyle. Uh, so basically, Smith's cultural analysis unmasks these alternative habituating forces as secular liturgies. And the uh, implications for the church uh, and Christian community is to develop uh, an ancient and uh, to use the liturgies of the church to, uh, to create alternative uh, liturgical habits and routines that both elucidate the telos of these secular liturgies, uh, but ultimately challenge them and offer an alternative. Uh, so a holistic pedagogy that situates doctrine and theology within the habituated practices of the historic <coughs> Christian church may cultivate a distinctive community through which the gospel of Jesus Christ can assume its visible embodiment in the world, such that it produces practical, concrete social transformation towards its eschatological vision of human flourishing and social justice. discussion in line with the topic of the conference, looking at the logic of populism. So to begin with, we cannot call something democracy when we like it and populism when we don't. So this is towards a theory of populism as a historical cultural reason or uh, logic uh, using the US um, uh, as a case study, including evangelicals. Um, I don't have a lot of slides. I only have a few slides for things that I think would be best captured visually. So I'm going to begin by saying that populism is often... Yes, you warned me about this. Sorry. Uh, that populism is often critiqued as an enemy of reason or logic, as a tribal violator of rational government. I'd like to suggest that populism is better understood as precisely an expression of the logic of the society in which it is embedded, notably the specific reasoning or thinking about society and government. This may include liberal ideas about society and government, as the conference title um, suggests, but it may include many other ways of thinking about society and government specific to each society. To understand why populism is persuasive, which is my goal here, the understanding, reasoning, or logic must be investigated, along with the conditions that prod particular readings of these underlying of this underlying logic. I'll begin with a rubric that allows us to justify identifying the movement as populist, left or right, and I'll arrange from stronger and weaker types. Uh, I will use populist right for the belief that society is economically and demographically changing in unwanted ways that can be fixed by protectionist trade and immigration policy. In the US, this is often accompanied by small governmentism. More of all this later, just for the definitions. Um, uh, populist left, I am using, uh, marking as the belief that once again, the economy is changing in unproductive ways, but can be fixed by civil society and government efforts, including social services and programs to broaden access to resources and opportunities. So first to the rubric. Populism, uh, left and right is a way of presenting solutions. It's a way of presenting solutions to economic and way of life duress. Way of life duress refers to yeah. Way of life refers to a sense of threat to the way things should go down. To knowing what's fair, what's due you and due others. Often prompted by demographic or other societal shifts such as changes in technology or gender roles. Um, economic duress. Economic duress may, be, may include poverty or current un or underemployment, but also the sense that familiar paths to self-betterment are disappearing. Analyzing both um, 800 elections and 100 financial crises in 20 democracies since the 1870s, Funk et al. found that, quote, crises, financial crises put a strain on democracies, far-right parties see strong political gains, the left also sees gains as Adam Tu's notes in Crashed, How a Decade of Financial Crisis Changed the World. Populist um, solutions to economic or way of life duress aim at answering who is under unfair duress, why and how we have been wronged, and by whom, them. These questions are binary in form. 
Uh, us does not mark any school, work, or church group, but the binary of my group in struggle against those who are unfairly doing us harm. Each one of those words is important. The degree of binarity locates um, a movement along a continuum from strong to soft populism. Degree of binarity depends on the possibilities for understanding um, them as nonetheless a worthy opposition in the Vox Populi, how inclusive we are of a variety of social groups or how narrow, and the essentialism of the us-them struggle. In order to feel right and be thought effective, no, what happened? In order, this is the fifth and important point. Um, in order to feel right and be thought effective, populist solutions to economical way of life duress must be understandable. And while new ideas are not precluded from understandability, the most easily grasped solutions are often familiar. That is, a society's historical cultural material, and we heard a lot about that from Hungary, the society's historical cultural material grounds the pool of ideas, not that are populist, but from which populisms draw, specifically the ideas, once again, about government and society. So to the US as a case study, in addition to research on un and underemployment, especially in old industry regions, in November of 2018, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention reported that US life expectancy had declined for the third year in a row, mostly owing to deaths of despair, suicide, drug, and overdose and alcoholism. While the US GDP grew at a rate of 3.5% in 2018, and income for the very lowest workers rose, Nonetheless, uh, rose as a result of employment and social assistance transfers. The smaller uh, rise in income for working class and middle class classes were far outstripped. These rises in income were far outstripped by rises in costs for healthcare, education, food, housing, etc., fostering both a current duress and again this fear. Um, duress of the future. Looking at demographic or way of life threats, non-Hispanic whites will comprise less than 50% of the US population by 2044 and less than 50% of the American children by next year. White working class voters who fear that America, American culture is in danger from in foreign influence or immigrant influence were 3.5 times more likely to prefer Donald Trump in the 2016 election and continue support for his policies um, regarding the border war. In proposing solution to these economic and way of life duresses, both left and right populisms propose an us and a them but differ in their composition because they are drawing from different readings of America's cultural historical material regarding, again, society and government. The material most relevant to our topic today is Republican, covenantal, and liberal political theory. Now we will have the fastest review of Republican, Covenantal, and Liberal <laughs> theory ever known. In Republican and Covenantal politics, come to America through the reformed centers. Being part of the nation entails commitment to the common good, and contributing to the republic is how persons achieve their fullest potential. Government is seen as emerging from the people for its benefit against the rich, and uh, politically ambitious. And as for them, John Winthrop in 1630 declared the care of the public must oversway all private respects. Liberalism sees the individual as freer to separate from the polis and, demand, and governmental demands, demands of government, to pursue individual opportunity. Now this was a very persuasive idea in America, as immigrants fled oppressive states. Their very flight reinforced the advantages of separability, of leaving, of separating from the polis. The harsh frontier boosted the advisability of self-reliance, trust in one's local community, and wariness of faraway federal authorities. Even as national government grew, 
American localism continue to foster a democratic critique of authority, state and locals policies that differed from each other across the political spectrum right and rest, left, and the robust civil society that Tocqueville so admired. I want to uh, give an example of this from American left populism. Covenantal and Republican ideas, yeah, the government emerges from the, uh, of the, from the Republic and from the covenanted community. Um, these ideas about society and government are central in the pool of ideas, historical cultural material from which many left populisms draw. Them are identified as the wealthy who take an unfair share of societal resources and resist fair contribution to the common good. Us is uh, relatively inclusive for race, immigration, status, and importantly, national government is part of the us, seen as emerging from the legitimate people and responsible for broad-based opportunity. There is clear binarity on the American left, but not strong binarity, where them is identified on alterable business positions corporations that don't contribute enough to the common good, rather than on essentialist traits such as race. To illustrate, um, Sanders soft left binarity. Um, I have some comparisons to Hillary Clinton's more central um, per, uh, policy positions. So you can see for Sanders, his them was Wall Street and the rich who unfairly resist contribution to the common good. And here you can see some of the, uh, how it's played out in policy. Sanders wanted to increase taxes on Wall Street for free colleges. Clinton said no. She wanted to see an increase in private scholarships. Sanders wanted to tax speculative trading. Clinton says no. Sanders wanted to separate commercial uh, banks from investment bank. Clinton says no. Sanders wanted to tax uh, coal-powered and other fossil fuel. Uh, Clinton said no. And uh, these reflect his greater binary on seeing certain uh, economic interests in our society with as a slightly greater them uh, than Clinton's more centrist position. Sanders supporters, too, while not showing strong binarity, nevertheless showed greater binarity, this us-them, um, against the wealthy corporations, the um, insiders, uh, than Clinton or Obama supporters. And this is consistent with their soft, but nevertheless more populist stance. Sanders supporters showed more binary, a more binary view of mainstream politics and economics. Let's move now to American right populism. The localist tradition, the localist tradition, ideas about society and government. Right? We're focusing on those two aspects of the historical cultural material. These are important in the, again, in the pool of ideas from which must much right-wing populism draws, with its preference for civil society, the market, and local institutions. While this tradition has in many ways yielded much the best in America, under duress, present or feared, um, as people seek binary solutions in binary frameworks, local community becomes my community in struggle against them. This is a binarized reading of a very productive aspect um, uh, of American life, of American commitment to community. Thus, commitment to community may become, under duress, the determination not only of my support of community, but that newcomers are threats to be constrained, and B, the historical wariness of oppressive government may become suspicion of government per se, whose activities should be limited except to implement the constraints against outsiders required by A. There is stronger and greater permanence binarity where them is identified on essentialist criteria such as race or, interestingly, the non-locality of national government. That is, immigrants and minorities are seen as taking an unfair share of societal resources in crime or using social services, much as the populist left sees wealthy businesses as taking an unfair share of 
um, the, the, the national good. But because the new immigrants and government them for the populist right are identified on essentialist criteria, the binary is sharper and more enduring than it is if you identify an end of them based on alterable economic policies. A few examples quickly, beginning with gun ownership. So this will illustrate government as the them. Quote, an assault weapons ban, David French explains in the National Review, would gut the concept of an armed citizenry, citizenry as the final bulwark against government tyranny. What's the reason for an assault weapons ban? We're going to protect ourselves from the tyrannical government. That's the bottom line. Three quarters of American gun owners associate gun ownership with freedom. Government wariness is also found in the opposition to federal social services, even among beneficiaries of those services, those who, under Republican plans for, to re, uh, replace Obamacare, would have lost $5,000 in government subsidies for health insurance, voted for Trump, those who would have lost $5,000 voted for Trump by 59 to 36 percentage points. As Applebaum and Gebeloff write in their research, these people are frustrated that they need help from the federal government. They feel guilty about taking it and resent government for providing it. Third, um, anxieties about new immigrants were equally or more decisive than economics and support for Trump among white working class voters and continuous populist cause and, um, for uh, support for the border wall. These anxieties hold, they are maintained, though immigrants spur business, increase employment, commit fewer crimes than native borns, and though US faces at the moment a labor shortage at every single level of skill. While other Republicans propose pieces of a solution that keeps outsiders out, right? Who are the outsiders? National government, that's number one as an outsider, and then new immigrants and certain minorities. Trump gets out of all. His policies reduce government involvement in private health insurance, reduce government at all, overall, reduce government regulation of business, cut taxes, build a border wall, temporarily ban Muslims, impose tariffs on China, renegotiate on withdrawal from NAFTA, the TPP, and the Iran nuclear treaty. It's a perfect policy reflecting his um, expression of who them are. Trump's way of advancing, his rhetorical way of advancing these ideas, too, appeals to government and outsider wariness. In 2017, he described opening formally protected land to business development. And how did he describe it? As freeing America from government. And I quote, some people think that the national resources of Utah should be controlled by a small handful of bureaucrats in Washington, and they're wrong. Close quote. <coughs> Both his politics, policies <coughs> and his rhetoric resonate with the 45% of Americans who say there is too much government regulation in business and industry. In short, Trump's solutions, right, binaries present, prevent, present solutions to economic or way of life duress, Trump's solutions tap into long-standing, right binary uh, readings of what American government is, its suspect, and who American society is, the us. By long standing, I mean that Republicans showed significant support for a border wall, not just immigration reform, a border wall, as much as two decades before Trump was even a candidate. Trump is doing what we call hunting where the ducks are. Now on to evangelicals. The 81% of evangelicals who voted for Trump and the 75% who remain his supporters argue for substantial affinity between his platform and evangelical beliefs. Caution. We have an enormous methodological problem with this. First, American evangelicals are Americans. Their voting and their politics may be motivated by any of the things already discussed, economic duress, way of life duress, etc. Present, feared, um, all the things already discussed. Yet, in surveys, checking the evangelical box at the top of the survey means 
that the survey takers attribute all other beliefs to that are political opinions to evangelical belief. Surveys are not equipped to fact and do not factor out the motive behind um, other <coughs> political or economic beliefs. Um, I have a lot more material on the methodological, methodological problem should we want to discuss that or ask about it. So, what motivates evangelicals? As far as it seems that some evangelicals um, are motivated uh, and here to right populism because of religious matters, opposition to abortion and gay marriage. But much is motivated also by economic and demographic duress. <coughs> I suggest also that evangelical belief in small government solutions to these issues is a substantial factor in their voting belief. Wariness of government has very long and special traction among evangelicals for theological and religio-political reasons. First, as evangelical traditions place strong emphasis on personal covenant with God and among the covenanted community, they also emphasize the protection of the covenantal community from interfering forces. Second, as heirs, of Europe's persecuted churches, Anabaptists, the dissenting and low reform churches, who had the you know what beat out of them by the official state churches, these um, immigrants to the United States developed, uh, they actually came here with substantial sensitivity to tyrannical government in an effort to build the New Jerusalem unmolested by the state and unbothered by non believers. They followed the wisdom of relying on their trusted own communities and wariness of outsiders, be it potentially interfering, controlling oppressive government, or simply other people unlike themselves. As this history and theology interacted with the rough conditions of American settlement and frontier, which also reinforced strong communities, Evangelicals became the backbone of American society development in, in do-it-yourself, self-reliant localism. The largest government office in the antebellum period was the Postal Service. But by 1850, the churches, most of them evangelical, had doubled the employees, twice as many facilities, and raised three times as much money. They built everything. With post-bellum industrialization um, urban poor, evangelicals continued their efforts in poor relief and society that, um, development, famously in the social gospel, which ran programs for the poor and provided <coughs> America's first critique of laissez-faire capitalism. Evangelical socialism was strong into the 1930s. Okay. Thus, evangelical support for Republicans, all right populism, is not a Faustian bargain of evangelical votes in exchange for Republican cooperation on religious matters. That's not the deal. Rather, evangelicals, let's see what happens. Yes, evangelicals are drawn to their own beliefs in self-reliant republic unmolested by an overreaching government a government that overreaches in taxes and regulations and in their resistance to other intruders to protect themselves. For example, they have been a consistent supporter of Grover Norquist's <coughs> anti-tax um, position as a religious position. That's resistance to federal government. In 2004, four, that's 15 years ago, the legislative priority of the Christian coalition was to make Bush's tax cuts permanent. When Trump became the candidate, evangelicals supported him on the idea that personal flaws notwithstanding, we get it, God works through flawed people, we get it, he would be about the best society in religious and extra-religious, economic and political arenas. Those for whom religious concerns are paramount have faith, faith, that Trump will move policy toward evangelical <coughs> positions, which we has done. For instance, in issuing an executive ruling prohibiting federally funded health clinics from providing or giving information about abortions. 
those evangelicals across the economic spectrum, from rich, and there are many, to poor, for whom economic matters are paramount, they have faith that the Trump tax cuts and regulation reductions will protect, protect the economy from a huddling government, as many other e uh, Republicans and non-evangelicals do. They're voting from their belief in small governmentism, born out of their historical wariness of central government. Those for whom underemployment and way of life uh, uh, okay, leave that thing. Those for whom un and underemployment and way of life are paramount. <laughs> the evangelicals who control the plumbing are re uh, really speaking up. Um, I'm at my final sentence. So I'm going to prevail. Those for whom un and underemployment and way of life are paramount. These two directions we have been talking about have faith that tax cuts, reduction of re uh, regulations on business and finance, plus protectionist immigration and trade policy that's really annoying, um, <laughs> will benefit the economy like many non-evangelicals do, but that they will also protect the nation from the Latino threat, um, from Muslim terrorists and other interlopers. But note that this is best understood by exploring the long-standing reasoning of America about society who's in and out, government, its size and composition, and the duresses today that prod binary readings of this long-standing logic. Thank you. Theology of the literal governance. It seems neoliberalism has become a magic word to explain why now democracy fails on the global scale. But researchers and thinkers, including Mark Beaver, argue it's necessary to pay attention to what can be clarified by the framework that is neoliberalism in the current politics. However, even though it's better to keep in mind that black and white neoliberalism can serve it's still crucial use to stick to and improve the analysis of neoliberalism. Let it destroy and throw in the baby out. So the problem is how do we find the narratives of the literal time? And the answer is to introduce a political perspective. To achieve this goal, this politician develops as follows. First of all, we need to confirm and confirm uh, the advantages and disadvantages of the two Korean government studies. Which is believed to be one of the most practical frameworks on the subject. Then I will want to examine again the critique of Foucault. George Agamben scrutinized and revived the Foucaultian narrative in, in his King Damien Gregory, originally published in 2007. In a word, Agamben returns the Foucaultian narrative to the appropriate context, that is, theology. To my knowledge, government is one of the first to deal with the problem of government in the scheme of political theology. However, it's crucial to distinguish the political theological analysis by Agamben from the anti political theological project. That is because Agamben constructed the century messianism to abandon the eschatology of Carl Schmitt. Thus, it's imperative to seek alternatives to the Agamben of one. This presentation is going to so, conclude by proposing an open and expression of what will come to reflect. And by the way, this presentation owes much to the recent pioneering work by Adam Kotsko on neoliberalism and demons, published last year. So, this presentation intends to bolster the study of the future. Foucault has played an essential role in a variety of areas. His concept of biopolitics is revolutionary in this sense. However, many researchers have been fascinated for the last decades by his concept of governmentality. What is governmentality? Firstly, firstly Foucault defined governmentality as a whole process aiming at population, not people, by their creation, tactics. Analysis and so on. Secondly, he describes it as a 
tendency in which governments become superior to the forms of power, such as sovereignty and discipline, in the study. And Foucault began his study on governmentality in his lecture at College of France in 1978. The title is Security, Territory, Population, and but it's in it's is in his lecture in 1979, the purpose of, of biopolitics, that Foucault develops his study and ventures on the analysis in a literary and governmental perspective. Foucault situates the origin of neoliberalism in the thought of all the liberalism, which was initiated by Barthor Ogen and uh, developed by the Freiburg School. Foucault points out all the liberalism and its followers are contrary to the classical liberalism in that, uh, in that it accentuates the importance of the competition in the market, which subjugates the be of order to market. While the classical liberalism considered the foundation of the market as exchanges between free men, Foucault expands his analysis into the solid Chicago School American version of neoliberalism and the emergence of economics through tracing the European capital. However, it's a fact. The Foucaultian perspective on neoliberalism has become already one of the mainstream. For instance, the Sage Handbook of Neoliberalism, published last year, lists the Foucaultian approach as one of the most useful frameworks. As another example, Wendy Brown, in her award winning work, and doing the demos, demonstrate how the Foucaultian approach could be applied to the analysis of neoliberalism. She rightly points out the difficulty and ambiguity of the Foucault lecture in 1979, which results from, the, from internal and external reasons that the Foucault However, it's worth questioning if these understandings do justice to what is at what at stake in the goal of Foucault. To understand this, to understand it, it's, it's, it's beneficial to point out discrepancies in the acceptance and reception of Foucault. For one thing, some researchers observed Foucault might have expected neoliberalism to work in a favorable way. For instance, Sergio Odier calls attention to the fact there is a context contextual difference between around the, during the 1970s and today. As, as he said, uh, Foucault approves of neoliberalism in that it's an alternative to the, to the economic interventionism, such as totalitarianism, planned economy, and Keynesianism, with the aim of achieving not govern too much, securing the free. Also, it's plausible Foucault considered neoliberalism as an alternative for Marxism at the time of the emergence of the non Marxist second left. But more important, some researchers who have worked on the sort of Foucault for decades, such as Michelin and Michael C. Behrendt, suggest Foucault is positive on neoliberalism in terms of his theoretical transition. Foucault Foucault already started to reconstruct his famous formula on power at this point in his lecture in 1976, Society Must Be Defended, and The History of Sexuality, Volume 1, published in the same year. Briefly, he changed his view of power from the binary structure of the penal law, discipline, penal law and discipline to the triad of law, discipline, and governance. That is because Foucault already observed the, the emergence of new form of power at this time, and on the other hand, Foucault forbore it. It's possible to, it's possible to construct a space of freedom from governmentality, which is a, a departure from the society penetrated by the, by the disciplinary power from perspective. In a world, the Foucaultian definition of neoliberalism is not a mere economic policy, but a worldview, which is political and ontological concern of freedom. Not a few thinkers have used Foucault to think against neoliberalism without fathoming his thought. In this sense, again, they propose an insightful question. In a whole cycle, again, they combine the Schmittian concept of sovereignty with biopolitics and reinterpreted the legal, political foundation of Western politics. In that work, again, they simply failed to consider governmentality. While in the kingdom and the glory, he ventured on it and attempts to criticize Foucault. 
Again, we are choosing like, Foucault, failing to consider the theological aspect of governance. His claim seems legitimate. Foucault wins security, territory, population, states, pastoral power, the, the, the original form of governmental power derived from ancient Orient, not ancient Greece and Rome. Foucault even adds, governance in this sense did not figure except in Christianity until the emergence of the police state. Although Foucault wants uh, three forms of power, that is law, discipline, governance, scope exist to some degree. To some degree, he has been oscillating on the levels of abstractness through his lectures. Thus, Foucault tells us if sovereignty and governance appear separately and uh, has a different substance. In contrast, again, this sheds new light on the, on the relationship between sovereignty and governance by supplementing, providing the discussion about the Trinitarian dogma, which means Governance has existed throughout the Western history, which is contrary to the Orientalist account of Foucault. By tracing the economic theology through reconsidering Aristotle to Thomas Aquinas, again, Ben succeeds in modifying Foucault in that again, Ben he shows how sovereignty and governance had an intrinsic link. Even though in his lecture, Foucault deals with the German politician Ludwig. It had to point it as a necessity of reconstructing the reconstructing relationship between sovereign states and market for the neoliberal competition to work. In spite of that, Foucault ignores sovereignty in governance when tackling neoliberal, neoliberalism in general. The bailout provided by the governments of the countries in the financial crisis is a good example, which shows how deep. Several states and big companies, but able to be independent competitors in market, are uh, connected in reality, in practice. However, there is also a problem <coughs> in the thought of Agamben. Although Agamben proves the again, Foucaultian's schema and provides a practical framework, he complicates the problems. That is only because he relies on the political messianism as a solution. Which we could classify in comparison with the eschatology of Shumi. The critique on the Restorania appears in the second letter to Thessalonians and plays a vital role in the sort of Shumi. Shumi expresses his genuine faith in the eschatology as early as in Theodor Doibra's novelist published in 1916, and even declares the Catechon. Catechon as, as the only possible way of bridging the gap between the eschatology and secular history in the north of the earth. It's possible, possibly, possibly Schmidt considers the, this eschatological, cataconic worldview as the foundation of secular politics. And against this, again, then depends on the messianism which is constructed through reading Benjamin, Yakov, Taurus, and a variety of materials. In a word, again, Ben always presupposes this practically implausible messianism. That is why it's indispensable to seek alternatives. To sum it up, contrary to the general trend, the Foucaultian analysis of neoliberalism contains more than that. economic policy. Foucault understands again governmentality as a political and ontological worldview and explores it in search of a space of freedom. Again, Ben revises the Foucaultian discourses and arrives at the essential relationships between sovereignty and governance by dealing with economic theology. However, at the same time, again, Ben presumes <coughs> for fetched messianism as an answer which is supposed to challenge its human theology. Seemingly, we need to seek an alternative to these extreme positions. Maybe it's a revised model of secularism, or maybe it's religious particularism, or the debate goes on secularism. Okay, we uh, auspiciously have 13 minutes. <laughs> uh, to, um, yeah, I don't know if I would marry to what the person is straight up.
So we do. Panelists want to come back up. We have half Yeah, I know. I have got You want to come back up and get yeah, questions? Okay, okay. So, questions? David. Sorry. Uh, so, I have a question for uh, Austin. Yes. Uh, I, uh, I really, uh, appreciate your, uh, your presentation um, in the way that uh, you emphasize action as a as a, as a counter to belief. Uh, I'm wondering about how uh, I mean, kind of it matches up in, in my mind to, to this this notion that that should have the, the decision as something that's um, has to be an action. Right? It's not just um, uh, shaped by an interpretation of fact, but it has to be an action. Right? Uh, and and I, I, in my mind, I've linked it up with, with, with Hannah Arendt's notion of, of freedom as something that only occurs through action, right? Um, but in, um, in, in, your, in your description of that, in referring to Wittgenstein, what I was a little bit unsure <coughs> about was the way in which you're setting up this pre linguistic realm as something that's just like purely the body. Right, because that's that's kind of you cited McIntyre on that, and uh, because I think that there really is a difference between a kind of animal body and a human body, and and the key difference is really in kind of the I guess the in in the human body it's already from the very beginning kind of linguistically shaped in a sense as something that has a different kind of teleology than animal bodies. And animal bodies. Yes, they're they're shaped by teleology, but it's a, a teleology of basically of, of survival and reproduction, and that's 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 all they get in terms of teleology. But clearly, human bodies are are shaped by other forms of teleology, precisely this type of teleology you get from like a religious tradition, and so um, and that has to be you know it's part of the habits that it develops. So even those supposedly pre-linguistic habits are already, in fact, linguistically preformed into habits that have a kind of teleology that's alternative to the teleology of an animal body, right? And so that's why I think we have to think through that relationship between action and, and belief in a more, I guess, maybe dialectical way, uh, and, and think through. It's, it's not just an opposition between ideas and actions. It really, I think there's this third aspect, which is um, figures, uh, metaphors, essentially. And I've referred to before as aesthetics, right? Yeah. But it's these kinds of figures that I think that really then are, are what are at work in, in this kind of shaping. Because, you know, figures, you know, are in rituals, are in language as well. Uh, but it's a, maybe a more general term for this, this type of shaping that's already going on. That, that's, that's the kind of question I, I'm wondering if, if, yeah. if you can think through that. I, I don't know. I had a question for Marsh, too, but we can get to that. Yeah, I mean, I mean, McIntyre argues that we should think of dolphins, for example, as pre linguistic, not non linguistic. Mm -hmm. So, to the way they communicate, that they do things for fun, seeming like they do activities outside of just survival in a way that is communal and in, in a way that reflects a lot of human activities and human behavior uh, beyond these kind of really simple reproduce, survive ways of thinking. So he's kind of arguing we shouldn't actually attribute that to animals in the way, quite the way we do, and that we should see those animals as being pre-linguistic in the same way that young children are pre-linguistic. And so there, there's some continuity of behavior there that we should see it uh, motivating that behavior and the engagement there. So they don't have the same kind of reflective capacity as humans have, but they have some of the same kind of communal elements of, of play and cooperation and, and those kinds of things. Um, so there is this sort of reflective element, and then this is where Wittgenstein comes in, is when children are first learning these things, they're just learning these really basic judgments that aren't linguistic. They don't, they don't really get the, the concepts or ideas yet. They just know, do that, don't do that, right? So there's very basic judgments about the world. Later, they can start to question, well, why shouldn't I do that? But, but initially, everything, ethical, aesthetic, is, is all just uh, approval and disapproval, essentially. Um, and so it's like this really basic level of behave this way, don't behave that way. And then over time, you acquire the reflective capacity to then evaluate those uh, habits and behaviors. I actually would like to just say something very short to this question on this. 
um, from my uh, reading in evolutionary biology, which are talking about sort of the, what, what is the constitutive relationship between language and action. And from an evolutionary perspective, it's a mutually constitutive evolution over about a million and a half years, where um, communication emerges from what Girard called mimesis, but you don't have to be a Girardian. Um, which is highlighted by we have very long, vulnerable childhoods requiring extended relationship between older humans and baby humans and toddler humans. And in this long, protracted period, there's a great deal in pre-language, uh, not homo sapiens, homo erectus, whatever they were before they were homo, the, all the phases, I don't want to go through the linguistic line. Um, um, there's... Uh, uh, exchange, copying, mimesis, and exchange of uh, gesture and facial expression. Now, these are actions um, uh, that is a precondition. This exchange of action, just copying gestures, copying facial expressions, um, is an exchange of actions that is part of the development of uh, the capacity for what we call now language. So making uh, that may so making um, making so there's not that we have actions and over here we have language, uh, but in fact the very development of our language emerged <coughs> from our particular human development out of actions. So they're much more intertwined, which I think speaks to your concern that we not, um, they're much more intertwined even as a matter of evolution. Um, so. Yeah, I'm gonna add something too on this time, from a slightly different perspective. But if you think of McIntyre as trying to get somewhere in between uh, kind of materialist evolutionary view in which we are largely mechanical in some way or another, and the Neoplatonic view in which our bodies have virtually no importance. And he's trying to find a place where we can say that our bodies are significant in terms of action, um, and that our whole selves are unified in terms of body and soul, and that then we can be articulate in our spiritual nature, in our actions, in our physical actions. Um, I think that we can, we can say, we'll leave the dolphins aside for a moment. I mean, I'm happy to leave the dolphins aside <laughs> and worry about whether I'm a vegetarian or a, a dolphin eater. Um, not a dolphin eater, don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> um, and say, but what he's trying to get at, I think, is something that you're not going to object to, which is this idea that as embodied creatures, with an evolutionary history, we actually have the capacity that is pre-linguistic, proto-linguistic, potential linguistic, that is partly physical as well as medical clinical. Um, yeah. So um, I, I, need, I need to <laughs> respond to that because um, I think that the really we really need to hold on to a, a very important categorical distinction here. And it's uh, it's it's rooted in Purse's distinction between um, uh, a kind of uh, a kind of relationship that's based on an index and one that's based on a symbol, right? Now, animal communication is entirely based on indexical signs, right? Which is to say that uh, we okay, well, we, we, but, well, we can talk about it, right? But uh, it, it entirely is. It really is because in, because as, as soon because it, you know. Their, their evolution is based on the process of natural selection. And natural selection is a process of indexical science because it's, if, if something changes in the environment um, that pushes in a certain direction, that's going to change the animal behavior or the animal, you know, the, the different characteristics. That's an indexical relationship. Uh, it's, a, it's a correspondence in fact. Now, uh, the beginning of humans is probably with Australopithecus, Right? Because Australopithecus was this period, sort of, you know, whatever, between three and whatever, two million years ago, right? Where um, there must have been an initial um, type of very basic symbolic um, sign usage, which I think, you know, the, the, the best argument I think is, is Karen Steakin's argument that the, the very first use of symbols 
right, was not a, a communicative type, but really was probably a, 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 an ordering of gender relationships, like with kinship relations, in which um, you might have had Australopithecus scenes, which, which had already a kind of instinctual mode of sort of uh, gender relationships, right? But then was, um, in, in a sense, there was some, some bright, probably Australopithecus scene female, right, that all of a sudden imposed upon her, 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 her progeny uh, a kind of a sign, or something like that, like a like a, a mark on their forehead to say, look, you're part of um, this group, and you're going to have to leave. This is the, the males, right? They just have to leave, right? And that already is a, a first sign of, in a very basic symbolic system. What's important about a symbolic system is that the signs don't refer to things in the world, but they refer to other signs. Right. And once you have that, you've got two signs and one rule, and that's the grammar, right? right. And so, and and, and so. Animals don't do that. There's, there are no animals that have signs that relate to other signs. And so that, that's, the, that's the threshold. And once you have that, then you've got a whole different process of habit and behavior. So, right. So okay. um, the, I don't know, we don't want to necessarily take the whole question period to develop it, <laughs> but, but just to respond. First of all, this happens in stages, not, not yes. necessarily it's, one, it's, one person well, having one. But well, there's something more important. But what and I and I didn't fully express it before. What's what's meant by um, mimesis? The, why mim why copying gesture um, and copying facial expression is not indexical in the way you've just described it, and because it creates the um, copying, it also creates the ability for proto language tool making, transfer of complex um, information and. And eventually, about a million years ago, the ability to reenact past events, this is entirely symbolic, and to project events into the future. And once you have these, you have the conditions for proto-language. And uh, there are some wonderful people, Sarah Hurdy and Donald Merton and many, many others about this. If you're interested in reading, I'd be happy just to give you a few citations. But this long um, development from in uh, like from <coughs> gesture that is indexical uh, by your definition to um, exchange of facial expression and gestures right before language that is be not indexical, which is symbolic because it is enabling communication not about the thing in front of you. You can't communicate how to make a tool in general if you can only com communicate how to hit this rock on this thing now. If you can't communicate that if you always hit this rock on this thing, you will get an arrowhead. You can't, make, you can't teach people how to make tools into the future. So there's this long period where, in fact, this mimicking of gesture and mimicking of facial expressions precedes what we call now full-fledged langu uh, language. But, uh, at, but what it allows for is the preconditions of language, including the reenactment of past events, the ability to repeat present events in the future, but also to project into the future things that haven't yet happened. And that's what with the literature on mimesis and gesture and communication and language talks about in greater length. Let's, let's okay, go. so I think we have a couple other questions here and then Pekka. Um, so while we're on signs, symbols, and gender, I have a question for Edward about money. Um, mm. You mentioned that you think that people don't need to use money to participate in great exchange and cited domestic care, which sure. often goes uncompensated as one example. Um, but I would ask first whether you think that that is participation in the great exchange or rather mediated participation through one player, namely the husband. Um, and if you would say that it is, I would ask how you would feel about the practice recently described by an anthropologist in the book Primates of Park Avenue, wherein high-earning men pay their stay-at-home wives a so-called wife bonus, which on the one hand compensates them for labor that we usually balk at the idea of compensating, but on the other hand does enable them, therefore, to then participate in the Great Exchange more broadly. Okay, the Great Exchange, and I wasn't clear about this, so thank you for the question. 
um, I wasn't clear, I hope because of reasons of time, but not because of reasons of obscurity of my mind, that um, everyone participates in the great exchange. Caring labor is, labors of love are not only, there are various aspects of them in the human condition, but one of the aspects is the economic aspect of a gift of self, a gift of your labor, your skills, your time to humanize the world, in particular to make your house clean, well probably the primates of Park Avenue have someone else to make their house clean, but to take care of your child um, and so forth. Um, and so they're definitely part of the great exchange. And in most cultures, traditionally, um, well, let's say up to quite recently, it was pretty much normal that there was this model of a breadwinner and a housewife um, and they were both laboring. One was laboring for pay, and one was laboring at domestic labor. And then the, the money system was used to make sure that the things you needed to buy money were available to the family. So the money system was, was not, as it were, it was sexist, if you want, because the women in this standard model didn't actually earn money, but it was, as I always say about money, it was convenient because it allowed the things that you needed to buy that were made for money to be paid for by money, and then they were distributed. So a wife, I, I mean, I'm a little bit puzzled by the wife paying. Um, there used to be a husband paying system in lower middle class or lower class families in England because the husbands would drink so much, the wife would collect the money and give her husband an allowance. Um, and that also is very similar, is that you share the money and you share the, the labor, um, and sometimes you allocate a certain portion of money to one party or the other, because in the money part of this great economy, the great exchange, um, there's certain things you need to buy, and it maybe the husband wants to buy his booze, or the wife needs to buy the, the shopping. Again, one imagines in Park Avenue, someone else takes care of all of those things. Um, but um, I presume, I guess she buys lunch with her friends. That would be what the, the wife does. Um, buys daycare, whatever. Um, so it, it's, it's there, but the, the great exchange continues. Um, and whether it's sexist or unfair, is because we value money, money that has a sociological um, importance that is not really there in the real economy. The real economy is this labor and consumption. We put a sociological um, scale of values on different kinds of labor. One of the ways we identify that is by people being paid, having a higher sociological value than people who are not paid for their labor. Um, and that's an interesting phenomenon. It used to be that people who didn't get paid, aristocrats, had the highest value for their labor. We've shifted that around. There's nothing inherent in money that makes it high value. It's just a social judgment. Okay, we have 10 minutes left. Stop at 11.15. Okay. Uh, wonderful. It's a good place. I'd like to ask questions to all of the presenters. Uh, but this goes to Ed Edward also to continue this. Uh, um, anthropology of money is a wonderful field study and can explain not only what people believe about money and the relationships that are connected uh, to money but also with behavior, for example, money given to people, or money found, or, or, or somehow gotten free, like a, a winning in a, in a gun, uh, seems to be behaviorally less valuable than money earned by labor, and, and so on. Uh, th these kinds of things are real. Uh, but then, how do you... Uh, uh, include in your uh, classification of the functions of money the fact that money can also serve as a, a medium of exploitation. For example, in gambling, it's a huge transfer of money from the poor to the rich, or or the uh, quick uh, unsecured loan business, or um, the uh, in fact the the global financial uh, economy as such is. Uh, and system of exploitation where money is key. If you can't do it without money, well, uh, money has 
not only value in the sociological and anthropological or semiotic sense, but it has real value. Uh, someone had worked sometime, some way, to give value to this sum of money that is taken away from a war card or scattered. Um, okay, that's a complicated question in a way. Um, <laughs> I will try and answer it indirectly. Um, well, in a way, it's a very simple question. Um, money as a tool for rewarding labor and as a tool for um, paying for consumption is, as it were, the ontological center of what we use money for. And then we do other things, partly because we have these other kinds of money, savings money or treasure money, that we move around. And partly, and gambling is, 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 is at the edge of my, my explanatory model, but it's a kind of wage uh, of a sort that is, um, it, it does take us into a different symbolic realm than the basic economic realm. So it's a sociological relationship rather than an economic relationship. And so it is a place where my model is a little bit uncomfortable, I will say. <laughs> um, and and that, that, that is there. Now, I, I have a whole lot to say about finance. And gambling really fits into this model, into this part of the model. Um, and finance, like gambling, is basically a way to take money from the poor and give it to the rich. It's a, it's a, uh, it's a sort of tribute. You know, it's, I mean, in economics, we talk about rent. It's an economic rent. And that's a sociological relationship that does often take place with token money, part of it. And, and that's relevant to, to this. Um, and so it, 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 it has a kind of non-economic, it's, it's a little bit outside of the great exchange um, in, its, in its logic. But as I said, and I didn't really say it very much in this very short form, a lot of the things that we have num money numbers for, the prices, the wages, the income you get as a, say, recipient of the income from gambling, um, not the winnings, but the recipient, the intermediary who takes most of the money uh, in the long run, um, they may not be obviously connected to the labor you do. There's a kind of fluidity in parts of this. Um, and and that's, that's a little bit, makes the whole thing a little more complicated. But what I want to do in talking about it is to get at the core of this idea of money, which is this, this tool in the great exchange. And then there are these sociological overlays that are very important. But I want to look at the sociology and not at the money. Because I think sociology is much more important. And the symbols that money have are also very important. And then to try and separate that out from the actual practice of the labor and consumption in the economy, because I think it's a different part of human nature than our arrangements of society. So I have a question for Marcia. Um, I'm just kind of giving my kind of a, a sort of a brief overview of my perceptions of the religious right, starting in 2008, which is that, of course, when um, uh, the Democrats finally they took the White House, there seemed to be all this soul searching that the religious right had failed um, and that they should withdraw from politics. Right? If you look at Rod Greer's blog, right, I mean, he's like, you know, full of this stuff, right? I mean, that, you know, that Christianity no longer has any kind of grounding in American society. Right? And, just, and, and there's this moment of, of, of real retreat, right? It seemed like the religious right had actually was, uh, had become basically a spent force, right? With people, with many of its leaders saying, well, you know, we should actually reflect on ourselves. Um, but then, of course, you know, like eight years later, it, it seems now to be to have, um, if you look at mass media, ma uh, establishment media, to have stormed back and, and is now the, the kind of the, the major, um, I don't know, like, like social power, right? Um, and, uh, and the more paranoid version of it, of course, is that, oh, well, these are the forces that are leading us to some kind of, you know, fascism or whatever. And I'm, and I'm wondering, like, you know, how do you account for this kind of vast um, swing? Right. I mean, and, and is and is this and, and what is the reality? Right. I mean, is it is it that um, um, that sometimes that, that that forces that are weak, you know, can be really inflated in, in, in the media, or is there some kind of underlying strength um, at you know in you know of, uh, I mean, is, is, you know, does the religious right somehow and you know, rediscover some kind of magic formula, right, where whereby it, it stormed back into power, or 
or is, is, or, is, or is this all just a series of weird accidents and misunderstandings in which you know people are are um, I don't know like uh, like overreacting right to um, what's happening in the U.S. Thank you for the question. Uh, I'm selling vials of that magic formula after the. Uh, <laughs> um, so first of all, be very wary of what you read in the mainstream media of evangelicals, uh, because sensationalist stories get to get, get to uh, get printed, and a great deal of other research and uh, reality on the ground does not get to get printed because it doesn't sell papers or websites or whatever the media medium is. Um, so uh, American evangelicals are Americans. And they have uh, fluctuations. Uh, there's, a, there's one or two parts uh, answer to your question. One is that there are fluctuations in evangelical behavior in the same way that there are fluctuations in American behavior. There was a move to the Democratic Party and something like left or center left or something in 2008 with Obama. The country moved there and evangelicals moved there. For example, um, uh, well over a third of evangelicals under 40, that's not the youth vote, right? By the time you're in your 30s and 40, you have kids, you have, you have mortgages, whatever you have, you know, orthodontor bill, orthodontor bills and so on. Um, over a third of evangelicals um, under 40 in 2008 voted for Obama. So there was a move in 2008 in the um, evangelical community in the way the rest of the country was moving. They, um, so they are um, evangelicals, like most people, are not governed by one factor. And if you'd like, we can talk more about the methodological issues there in um, survey, uh, in, in conducting surveys and so on. And then as the country moves right, you would expect evangelicals, like every other demographic group in this country, well, not every other, many de right, demographic groups, including that big swing vote center, to which now more people belong to the independent swing vote than belong to either Democrat or Republican loyalists, so to speak. So there's going to be an uptick when the rest of the country moves right, for, right, for example, to uh, an uptick among evangelicals to move right. Um, so that phenomenon is frankly unremarkable. Um, so there's the media part of it, there's the evangelicals move as America uh, moves. Um, and, but the, uh, the third part is that there is a very serious uh, minority of evangelical, outspoken, intelligent, and with lots of media outlets who are uh, gravely and seriously anti-Trump and are critiquing their fellow uh, uh, brothers and sisters in Christ um, for their adhesion to um, right populist positions, Republican economic positions, and in particular to Trump. So this is about 25% um, didn't vote for Trump, and even now are, uh, and now are even more vociferously opposed to Trump than they were in 2016 because they see actually the policies were alignment. And one doesn't have to be a very sophisticated evangelical to understand that Trump's policies are not the, uh, reflecting being the hands and feet of Jesus. Okay. So, um, so that's kind of right. So 25%? Right. Yeah. Okay, I want to ask, hung Hungary, would you say there's 25% of the Christian community that would be anti-Orban? Yeah. Well, more than more than more than that. Yeah. Oh, I didn't mean twenty five percent Christians. I mean, all Christians. I, that's twenty five percent of white evangelicals, not of all Christians. That's a different statistic. Fair enough. Um, so we've got all those three things going on. I just wanted to make a quick comment about the change of the culture because um, I think you know, for uh, since two thousand, uh, since two thousand, like the main image of the evangelical in the American popular culture was Ned Flanders, right, from The Simpsons. But somehow um, that image has been displaced by The Handmaid's Tale. And so it seems to me that if we want to have a realistic depiction of, I don't know, of, of today's world, we would have to have Ned Flanders in The Handmaid's Tale um, as um, you know, they, you know, they, patriarch. Right? You know, that has been my argument since I started doing field work on evangelicals, which is um, 15 years ago or something, 13, 14 years ago, is that what's going on on the ground 
is mostly not in the mainstream media. The good news is there's a little bit more, but a little bit more reflection of the variation in, of, eva, of evangelical practice and belief, white evangelical practice and belief in the mainstream media. You will get people like Amy Sullivan or other people in the Washington Post and so on writing about their dismay um, at the evangelical right. You will get uh, not only Randall Barmer, um, but Greg Boyd and, uh, and Tree Robinson and Joel Hunter and many, many, Tony Campolo, <coughs> Shane Claiborne, who's a pop star, uh, of the white evangelical youth, um, and many, many others um, who um, are very publicly um, critiquing, protesting against the evangelical right. So that's also going on. And we are now, when I started my field research, and even when my book came out in 11, there was no visibility of this in the mainstream media. Now, if you look, you can find a little. OK, let's thank the panelists.